Keith, could you begin by telling us something about the Commission, what it does, what its history is? Thank you very much. You know, it's a pleasure to do that. Um, the Commission is, uh, is an intergovernmental body set up under FAO. So member countries back in the 1950s, early 1950s, said we want to control foot and mouth disease in Europe and we think FAO can help. We'd like to set up a commission and uh, we will pay for it. So it's a commission paid for by our member countries. And how do the member countries feel? Do they still feel under threat? You had an outbreak in Great Britain in the not too distant future. So yes. it's not a job that's finished, but, but how do member countries feel about the threat they face? Well, um, when you're faced with a number of um, uh, disease threats, then foot and mouth disease might go back on the list. But in, in European terms, they recognize foot and mouth disease is probably the most economically uh, disruptive of all of our major diseases. And an outbreak in any one of our countries out of 36 or even in the neighborhood tends to uh, interrupt trade. And trade is hugely important, not to every single European country, but many of them are exporters. Sometimes member states are themselves not putting it a high priority, but there's general agreement across the, the board that this is really something that has to be prevented. So what is the situation around the rest of the world? Are there things like hot spots that you worry about? Uh, very, very definitely, yes. Um, uh, compared to perhaps avian influenza or human influenza, uh, this is a disease which is localized to approximately seven major areas in the world. And we recognize these as being different because within those regions, the strains which are present are really unique to those regions. So it's a disease that uh, evolves constantly by movement in animals, but they are evolving within what are really epidemiological regions. And those regions are uh, Southeast Asia with China, uh, South Asia, that's uh, India and the neighbors to the east. That's uh, one particular uh, vir region of unique strains. Then we have uh, what we call West Eurasia, Pakistan, Afghanistan through to the Middle East. Again, these are unique strains to that area. Then um, in Africa, approximately three major areas which have dif distinct strains, and South America. There are some countries which are more important and some are less. Uh, but within regional programs, we think that's the way to deal with the countries which are perhaps the, the highest importance, and others which are, less or more spared by the position those have the greater chance to, to become free at partially or completely. And are there specific efforts underway in one or more of these regions to eradicate FMD? Yes, um, I, I would say that the, the, uh, the great examples of, of um, control have been in really in three areas of the world. Um, one is in Europe where we have this history of completely wiping out a uh, uh, a region that was endemic. Uh, so that's uh, one success story. Uh, Southeast Asia and China have a long-term roadmap for, for uh, reducing and then eliminating the, the infection in, in a zonal level. And um, South America. South America has uh, planned to be completely free so that it's no longer in the Americas. And that has been uh, successful to the point that there are only just um, really two kind of sub-regions that are affected that remain in South America. Uh, in the rest of the world, we're at the beginning point. Um, for West Eurasia, FAO has um, brought the countries together to make a long-term vision and a roadmap for control. And we now meet on an annual basis to review the progress in those regions. In Africa, things are really uh, just beginning. Southern Africa has been quite successful, but has the problem that wildlife are a reservoir. Mm -hmm. uh, as you move into East Africa, you have a, a very complex situation, mix of uh, wildlife that interface with domestic animals, and uh, it's very complicated, probably the, the most difficult in the world for design of programs. And so how do you design a program? What are the technical principles which underpin a program to eradicate FMD? Well, uh, one thing that has to be recognized to start with is this is actually uh, 
It's possible, but it is enormously difficult to eradicate. Um, many countries are starting at a very low starting point. Uh, they know they have the disease. They know it's a, a big impact into certain sectors, particularly the dairy area. So we came up with uh, a framework for activities to bridge that gap, which we call the progressive control pathway. The progressive aspect is that it's easy to start. It's not expensive for countries to begin this program. And the first thing you need to do is to identify uh, uh, who is affected, uh, how serious is the disease to that sector or economy, uh, what are the critical points you can address, and um, uh, what are the cost benefits of doing something. That's to make a plan. So, so the pathway starts with achievable steps. And the first step is to put into place a plan. And uh, we believe that if within regions, the way forward is for every country to be somewhere on the pathway. Even if you're limit only made a plan and you know the situation, that's a step forward and it helps the neighbors. So the idea of the the progressive control pathway is a tool to help us compare the progress of countries. That will help in regional meetings because one country will expect to see progress in the neighbor. It will help us designing programs for those countries. And it will help the, the uh, civil servants in the country to argue for or against different options, different costs, different benefits. That. Um, what do we really do in terms of making a difference? That actually usually relies on vaccination. Vaccines for foot and mouth disease have been around commercially for around 50 years. Uh, the price has dramatically dropped over the years. The quality has uh, internationally gone up. We know how to make a good vaccine now. Um, it's still an, an expensive item to produce. It's not a cheap one like for most poultry vaccines. So that's an issue. But it's cheap compared to the price of a liter of milk. So protecting dairy animals should not be out of the means of most producers. Earlier this year, we met when you were in Bhutan. I know you've been to Nepal, and now you're in India. Is there any particular comments you want to make about the challenge in South Asia? Well, this, is, this area is um, of incredible importance. Uh, livestock in this area are, are, are of huge importance, and I've seen that in each of the countries. Um, it's very clear that there's, there's rapid development taking place, it's, and it's very clear that in most countries rapidly developing, they decide that they don't want this disease because they, they find it's very expensive to produce milk, to export milk, to, to produce animals under these circumstances. So I think in this stage of uh, rapid development in this region, it's absolutely right to be thinking about um, uh, large programs for getting rid of uh, at least the impact of, of foot and mouth. It's very clear this is culturally different from other areas of the, of the world and it has its own particular cultural importance uh, placed on, on cattle, uh, on the life of animals, on welfare, and that has impact um, for what you can do. Uh, if, um, as we've mentioned, you need to vaccinate all animals, you need, someone needs to take charge of the animals to be vaccinated, and that's going to be, create some difficulties for vaccinating cattle, perhaps, in some of the countries. Uh, so I think, you know, given the scale of the livestock population, this is going to be a huge uh, program. Uh, but I think the gains can be made quite quickly in some sectors. Uh, and uh, perhaps as India, its neighbors develop rapidly in the next 15 years, there's going to be a general demand to reduce the inefficiencies caused by disease to, to get the most from your natural resources. Thank you very much, Keith. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us, and we look forward to your next visit to India. It's a pleasure. Thank you.